Thanks very much. Good morning, and thank you for having me here today. Again, my name is Morgan Klinky, and I'm with Arizona Cotton Research and Protection Council. And today we'll be discussing a little bit about AF36 prevail and our recent research findings with that. Um, to start, we start with mycotoxins because aflatoxins are the most poisonous mycotoxins that we have. Um, so they were first identified in the early 1960s, and they are a metabolic byproduct of fungal growth, meaning that they their natural state is already living in your soil. Um, so they're already something that's in your uh, soil that you may or may not have already have dealt with. Now, um, the different fungi produce different toxins, and the function of each of those is currently poorly understood. This is something that we're working on, as well as several others are working on too. And um, as we discover more and learn more, we're always happy to share the information that we do learn to help uh, better some of your, your guys' decision makings with your farms and crops, uh, as well as some of your farmers. Um, mycotoxins, specifically aflatoxins, are highly toxic to humans and animals. They are an immunosuppressant, they uh, cause inflammatory problems, and most commonly affect the liver in humans, and it's linked with liver cancer. And the effects of those can be chronic or acute. Uh, this is a slide showing the difference between two strains of aflatoxin. The S strain is your main toxin, is one of your main toxin producers. And um, on the right, the uh, green one is the L strain, which is a typical aphid strain. And AF36 actually uses an L strain and it is capable of producing toxin with that. And uh, the name AF36 36 is the 36th isolate that was looked at uh, when developing this technology by USDA and RS. Um, so that was kind of a little fun fact as to how that name came about. Uh, this is a slide that we like to use to show growers and PCAs to kind of help show how uh, AF36 works uh, within the soil. So think of each of these as a soil community analysis in three different time shots. Um, this first one here um, is our uh, control of untreated Arizona soils and soil community analysis with that. Um, all the red ones are your aflatoxin producers, your green is your atoxygenic strain, the F36, and the uh, light pink color is uh, any other fungi that may be in your soil. Um, and you'll notice that in this first untreated, that the atoxygenic AF36 is already in your is already in your untreated soil. This is because that in all the soil samples that we've taken, uh, we found that AF36 is already residing in uh, the soil, uh, some in lower levels than others, but we have found it endemic and naturally occurring in your soil. Um, so with one treatment of AF36 uh, is this next middle one, and you see that the population of AF36 is starting to uh, or fill the niche rather than uh, your aflatoxin producers. And it's important to note that AF36 does not increase your total fungal population. It simply takes the place of your aflatoxin producers um, before they're able to sporulate and affect your crops. And then the last slide is uh, would be after several treatments over a couple of years with an annual treatment of AF36 um, on your crop. And uh, the take home message from this slide specifically is that annual year over year treatments, we're finding that there's a buildup of, uh, of AF36 strains, leaving less room for aflatoxin strains to affect your soil and your crop. Well, you guys still put that out like the strain, like There are different application methods, and application methods is something that we're continue, continuously researching on. There is one way to do it. Um, we're also researching uh, for ground, whether it would be on an edge treatment, or um, we know a couple of growers might use a high rise or um, for some of the edge treatments. Again, that's ongoing research, uh, but um, to making sure that edge treatment is uh, has the same efficacy as applying to a whole field. Uh, as that research is completed, finalized, we'd be happy to share with you guys uh, what might be the most cost effective. Our current carrier is actually we've adjusted it into Milo, um, and we'll get more into that. Um, but the for the carrier for the point source of that with it being brown and also having a better distribution for a more effective distribution rate compared to these. And as uh, we just kind of mentioned, the AF36 prevails currently on a carrier, which is a sterilized mild seed coated with the atoxygenic strain uh, of the common fungus Aspergillus flavus, which again is common in most soils already. And it was the 36 isolate evaluated for atoxygenic pro properties discovered by USDA ARS. Um, it's important to note that it's a biological control agent, um, again, for the displacement of aflatoxin producing fungi. 
it, and again, it does not increase your overall fungal population in your soil. That's uh, and how does this uh, product work? So it uh, displaces or fills the niche of the toxin producing strains and thereby lowers your overall toxin producers in the fungal population. Um, so when the seed, whether it be wheat or uh, milo, is activated with moisture, it will begin to produce green spores, which in that um, first picture of the two, it'll have the green uh, fuzzies on it. So that way, uh, as it's carried through wind and insects, those spores will disperse and will be dispersed in the air across your so how do you measure the effectiveness of it? The aflatoxin levels alone are an incomplete measure of effectiveness. Testing the soil levels before application as well as after, so you can see everything in a full uh, in a full time loop to see where your starting point was and where your ending point was, as well as uh, should you continue application to see your buildup over time uh, with that. And that's something that uh, Arizona Crop Research and Protection Council is happy to do for you, for your growers is to evaluate those uh, soil samples. And uh, it's important to see those in a before and after level, before application and after application, and again, with annual treatment, because in high aflatoxin years, your displacement can uh, result in dramatically reduced levels, but in some, some instances, it may be in above optimal levels. So for example, that let's say that your um, field before treatment was uh, 10,000 parts per billion, a 90% reduction, which is, uh, isn't an uncommon reduction rate that we find, uh, That'll still leave you at a thousand parts per billion, which still may be above optimal levels. So it's not that the product didn't work; it's just that the product that it was a very high aflatoxin year for um, what your levels were seeing at that. We used to see, but we're still on the ground. Mm -hmm. I believe so. Yeah. We weren't sure what that was. But we, you know, in the old days, we had sneakies and we had things that that, that aggravated, you know, just this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Open, open, cold, and bold and stuff like that. Um, and our soil analysis are done through a uh, BCG analysis, and this is again critical for measuring those uh, for your uh, soil analysis for measuring the displacement of the aflatoxin producing fungi. Again, so you get uh, before shot and after shot as well as annual treatment. Shot. Uh, with that, and uh, we're always working to research and improve some of our methods, whether it's with uh, production and testing as well. Um, so we're currently working on a potential PCR analysis, which may uh, help speed up some of that time. If you're not familiar with it, BCG is a little bit drawn out process, uh, and it's uh, very time consuming uh, to do so. Are you working on stuff with corn and corn starting and stuff too? Uh, that's actually some of our big research. <laughs> Um, so agriculture activities modify the fungal community structures and may inadvertently increase your average aflatoxin producing fungi. Um, so in our research that we've done, we've uh, been able to see that uh, disrupting the soil for ag purposes uh, can actually increase your aflatoxin condition, can increase your aflatoxin conditions for the soil uh, for that. So it kind of increases your demand to have to think about how you're going to uh, reduce your aflatoxin level in your crop. This is a graph showing uh, some of the contamination uh, times of year when it may occur. Um, mm -hmm. So in this, it, aflatoxin producers increase with your crop biomass with condition, under conditions favorable to aflatoxin contamination. So you can see in the warmer months that when your cotton bolts are starting to be, that as your cotton bolts uh, are more present throughout the time of year, so it's your risk for aflatoxin contamination. Um, this is a recovery of AF36 recovered from a pistachio orchard. Um, so it's applied directly onto the topsoil into either uh, drip line or where moisture will be able to reach that product so it can activate and start to grow some of the green spores as we see here. And again, those are carried uh, throughout your field with good insects. And uh, the history of AF36 as well as our council started back in the early 1990s. And um, growers had actually, whenever this technology was discovered, that growers actually were trying to decide how this product was going to be produced and become available to the uh, growers and be used in the best of its ability. So we've been uh, very honored and privileged to be able to produce this and get this product out to you guys. And we're 
definitely here to offer product support as needed um, with you guys. So we've been very grateful for that. Um, so this is a little bit of what we've done throughout the years. We've expanded our label to corn, cotton, and tree nuts, pistachios, almonds, and figs, as well as across some state lines to help those um, who have been dealing with appetizing problems as well. This is a study that was done in Bowie, Arizona, and over three years, um, we saw an average level, an average AF36 increase of 380%. Um, your pre soil analysis on the average was at 15%, and uh, your post, our post soil analysis showed up to 72% with that. So we were really happy to see this, and this was recovered from pistachio orchards. That's, that's, that's me. Oh, really really sorry. Like, like, like okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this is a really interesting study, uh, I think, um, because this is something that shows the uh, some of the travel that's gone through with AF36. And again, as we previously discussed, that it is naturally occurring in the soil. So uh, in this treated field, um, our pre soil analysis right here were at 1%, and then the nearby field was at 3%. And then after, uh, after we applied and took our another soil analysis, our, next, our treated field was at 92%, and our nearby field was at 42%. So, something that we can say about this is that even though the nearby field wasn't directly treated, we are seeing uh, a little bit of carryover. We're still evaluating how far. Um, our AF36 is reaching as well as uh, our regular current, how much it's reaching from the treated field into the nearby field. So this is the silage study data that we're working on. This is carried from 2021 into 2022. And this was actually just put together, so we're really excited about this. Um, what we're finding with this is, uh, as you can see, there are pre-levels, our harvest levels, and then our crop harvest levels. Um, with AF36 between Buckeye and Goodyear, you can see that from the starting, there's definitely some uh, AF36 already present, as well as toxigen, as well as toxigenic strains already in the soil. You can see that over time, uh, the AF36 has become your dominant occupant in there. And what's really exciting about this one is because these results are consistent with what we're finding in cotton. So especially with corn and cotton being a rotational crop, this uh, is really exciting that uh, those levels are maintained throughout the crops and how it's affecting your as a soil with that. Some of our program goals that we have with our aflatoxin remediation program is to expand the use of this technology right now. Uh, whenever we first started, this was originally for uh, cotton and corn, and uh, we've expanded into the tree nuts, and we're uh, open to uh, offering this technology where it's needed, even if it's outside of those items or outside of those crops, as well as uh, any other geographical areas that may need it. Um, we're looking to improve and simplify manufacturing. This is also something that we're already working on. We're looking to expand our, or we are expanding our facility. Um, we're moving out into Maricopa, Arizona, and we'll be able to produce 27 million pounds a year out of that facility. Um, some other research that's been going on is adding new atoxygenic strains to effectively deliver the product, whether it's in singular or mixture of strains, or potentially offering uh, uh, advantages to our product line of uh, having rotational strains uh, to help mix those within your soil so it's not just the same strain every time. And we want to ensure that this, that, uh, this product is around for long-term availability to help manage uh, aflatoxins. Um, to our knowledge, there's very few uh, items that are out right now available to growers and PCAs to help mitigate aflatoxin. Um, so uh, we plan on being around and offering this product at uh, an economic price. We're a nonprofit agency, so we're definitely here to make sure that this product is here to really benefit the growers uh, and to make sure that you guys are helping or being able to produce the best, the best product possible. Um, the, most in, or the most direct impact that aflatoxin has on ag consumers um, is that it reduces your overall quality and that eventually leads to a loss in revenue, which we certainly don't want that. We want to be there to support our uh, ag producers. And um, lastly, to provide this technology again for commodities that need it economically, so whether that's expanding it or having more reach in the commodities that maybe aren't aware of, or they suddenly have a rise of aflatoxin um, just because it's a high year. 
Uh, maximizing the efficacy of this, first we have to understand that it is a biocontrol, meaning that it's a living organism, so it will need access to water, as well as having a protection from sunlight. Uh, and so a lot of this comes with uh, understanding application, and we're happy to work with you uh, with application and how it can best suit your carbon, your carbon needs. Um, so the, and having it in a conducive microenvironment. So our product support that we offer, we do offer the soil sampling and we're happy to communicate with you on what those results were before and after, if that's something that you're interested in and provide those individual recommendations. We'd be happy to come out and see your operation and uh, see what works best for you, especially when it comes to applying, uh, applying the product for you guys. The timing of application for uh, the items that we're labeling for cotton, we're looking at late May through June. Um, for corn, B7 to silky and pistachios late May through early July. Um, you definitely want to make sure that there's sufficient moisture. We say that within three days of application, have moisture so those spores can, can begin to develop and spread. And also after cultivation is complete, this isn't something that you want to uh, bury down in the soil. You definitely just want to apply it on, uh, onto the top soil. Um, this is a couple application methods that we've been. Uh, experimenting with, and uh, again, this is a continued experiment that uh, we're always working on. Um, so the two pictures on the right is one application method with uh, blower, and that one was uh, taken through the field to help disperse it on uh, two sides at once. And this is one uh, on the top here with an example of uh, doing an edge treatment with it. And again, that's an ongoing study to see. Is that a blower? Yes. Yeah, the pneumatic blowers. And then this bottom one is actually application in the orchard, uh, having it on the back of the floor with it. And then this is a uh, snapshot of what our new facility will look like out in Maricopa. And again, I'm really excited for this one to be able to improve our production and make this product as available to you guys uh, as possible for that uh, to be able to keep up with the demand for apple blossom. Our potential for future research being the uh, here in the Arizona Crop Research and Protection Council, we are uh, very eager to continue our research and to have the relationships uh, with you farmers and PCAs to, to help out where your aflatoxin needs are, uh, should you run into any. So uh, improving our commercial production technology, as well as improvements in the application technology. Um, so if you guys ever have any ideas on better ways to apply or maybe something that works better for you. We're hoping hearing those and having those discussions with you. We'd love to have more interaction with some of our growers uh, to kind of see what your needs are for that. Um, also label expansion for the additional crops as well as expanding to geographic to different geographic areas. Um, Arizona is one hot place for aflatoxin, but it can also expand depending on uh, where you're at or where you're looking at from. And again, we have a high emphasis on a low cost product and high quality. Again, we're a nonprofit agency uh, who's here to help out for the benefit of ag producers um, so we're able to continue producing a quality product. And with that, we maintain a four growers, five growers philosophy for us. We've been very fortunate and grateful for our partnerships that we've built over the years and hope to continue those and grow our relationships and partners within those. So again, my name is Morgan from Key, and without me, I'd like to open up to any questions the first time. If not, I will let you know the rest of the program. So thank you very much. Yes. Are you guys um, doing this in California too? Uh, yeah, we are in California for uh, two months. Thank you. Memphis, yes. Anybody wear an area close to New York? I'm sorry, what's that? Anyone wear an area close to New York? Yes. What category uh, is this product? I believe we're classified as a pesticide. The reality is, it's a soil amendment. The EPA makes this great for the biopesticide. It's a biopesticide. Yes. 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 You can definitely reach out to me in regard to getting the product. Um, I like you may have a little bit better direction as to uh, what we're doing for the West Side. I'm, I'm representing sales and marketing uh, in terms of the field supervisor out there. 
Uh, yeah, for, for those of you that don't know, yeah. me, I'm the Clayton Lease Ground Director for Council. Morgan is our, our brand new this year, our first marketing sales this year. Well, maybe that's your proof on the So we're, we're, we're working on that right now, but of course, um, Morgan is going to help take some of the stress off on uh, taking a sales order for that kind of stuff. So through contact Morgan. And if you guys ever need anything, you're also welcome to contact me. Any other questions? <laughs>